Alrighty, so here we are in the lab working on, of course, pole position. And I thought what I would do is just kind of give an overview as to how I go about uh, reverse engineering the customs in general. I know I did a video on the, the uh, 10 series custom, now I happen to be working on the 4 series. And so I just thought I would go over in general how I've been going about it. Now originally what I would do is I would, you know, hook up my logic analyzer to the custom, grab a few traces of, you know, some of the behavior uh, as it was running in the board. And then what I would do is, just based on looking at this, try to get an idea as to how, you know, it was uh, architected inside the custom, what it, what it was designed to do and how it goes about doing that. And then I would, you know, program my own version, stick it into one of these guys, this is the FPGA, FPGA Arcade Custom, and then toss it in there and then um, run it, of course, in the game, which usually would not work, of course, and then bring up the waveforms, and then try to do a visual comparison from memory as to, you know, what is my custom doing versus what would, what would uh, what was the other one doing. And that was a real tedious process. Um, you know, just continuously looking at waveforms, trying to figure out where I went wrong, and making changes, and just going, you know, over and over and over and over. And so what I decided to do was uh, to use more of a software-based approach. And one of the reasons, or one thing that I realized that kind of led me to this, is this is really a pain to read this, uh, particularly the buses. This is the RA bus, which uh, comes out of the 4 Series Custom. And you can see that it gives you the breakout every single bit at a time. And so this is, happens to be a 7-bit bus, but imagine like an address bus, which is like 15 bits. You know, you can't just see it in hex across the screen here, it breaks it out every single bit and so it is a real pain to scroll through this both vertically and horizontally and try to make sense of it. What a pain. And so what I decided to do was um, take the information that's stored on the logic analyzer, send it over to my workstation over here because that's hooked up through an ethernet cable so I can just FTP onto it and grab all the data and I wrote a program to take all that data and to convert it into a waveform. This is a standardized format. It's called the VCD or a value change dump format. It's part of the Verilog standard. You don't need to know all that crap. All you need to know is it gives me this nice picture here. All the buses are now compressed into single lines. It makes so much sense for me to go now and read through this. I can scroll through it, you know, real nicely here, forward and backwards and everything else. And it just makes life much easier for me. So that was the first step, getting that program to convert what is on my logic analyzer sitting up there onto my workstation here so I can read it, understand it, and kind of make sense of it. Okay, so once I've gotten this far, the next step is really just to go ahead and start working on my implementation of the custom. So I believe I have a file here for the 4 series, which I'm currently working on. There it is. And so this is uh, written in a hardware description language uh, called Verilog, and there's others out there like VHDL, which you've probably heard. And allows me to kind of describe the architecture of the custom in like a high level language. I can describe registers and AND gates and OR gates and inverters and all sorts of stuff, but in a nice programming style language. And so once I've gone ahead and done all that, I can program into my chip and run it on the actual pole position board, but that's kind of what I was doing before, and that you know takes a while and it's kind of tedious and stuff. What I really would like to do is just kind of stay in software mode here for a little while keep churning on this until I know I've got it right or almost right, then burn it into the board and see how it reacts. And so what I realized I can do is reuse all this information as follows. So here's my uh, waveform, which has all the inputs that were sent to the custom and, and all the outputs from the custom. So I kind of have that, as you saw on my screen, and I created this, and this is called a test bench. It's basically just a virtual environment um, in software where I can plug in that RTL that was written in Verilog right there. And so what I decided to do, grab a marker here, is, is um, create, a, uh, create a script or, or a reader, I should say, that can take all this information from this VCD and use it in this test bench. And so what it actually does is takes all these inputs, all this input information, and sends it into my custom. So now my custom is being fed the same stimulus, the same set of inputs, that the actual one was over there in hardware. And then the outputs get compared, I need a new marker, to what's coming out of my custom. 
and so I can kind of just let this churn and run, you know, with with my whole waveform here, and then uh, I can look at the outputs, or actually the comparator will tell me basically say, you know, these signals seem to be lining up pretty good, or these signals are a little off, and so what I can do then is just go back into my Verilog file there and uh, tweak a few things here, and oh, okay, I see what my problem is. Tweak a couple things in there, turn the crank again, run it again, and see how close I am. Uh, and basically just keep doing that until it's an exact match to the waveform. And that is probably the bulk of the benefit right there. Um, now this, these waveforms are kind of small in size. There's only so much memory that my logic analyzer can hold. And so what I've found that I've had to do is kind of, you know, look for unique cases, you know, and make sure that I have, you know, a separate waveform kind of on file for each one of those unique cases. And then once I get this thing to pass 100% with a given waveform, I'll toss another waveform at and run it and make sure that it passes that. If not, oh, okay, there's another little corner case I didn't think of and, you know, add some more smarts into my little custom there and just keep doing that, you know, with different waveforms that I've captured until it matches 100%, right? That's what we want, 100% accuracy. And so, yeah, so that's my plan. I realize this is kind of technical, you know, a lot of techie talk here. And so for my non-technical friends, here's a short version of basically everything that I just said. Then you do this, then this, and this, then that, and this, and that, and this, and that, and then. And that's how we do it, folks. So there's my 4 Series Custom working on the board. It plays just fine. It took a while to get all the subtle issues worked out. There's lots of different things going on, like when the explosion happens, um, when he's passing by cars, and there's multiple sprites that are being um, rendered to the screen, at, all at different, um, what do you want to call it, different sizes, rather. Like, that's a single sprite, and then as it's getting closer to the screen, the logic in that chip actually, you know, makes the sprite you know, enlarge or, sh or shrink depending on where it is. And so there's a lot going on. It took a little while to kind of figure it all out, but but I think we're there. And so you can kind of see here too, like this is the progression of my little daughter cards. This is was just a generic one that I had so that when I was way back when, just troubleshooting, you know, my custom, I could hook up my logic analyzer to it and see what was going on. It was helpful, but I couldn't compare it to anything. So, um, so it was kind of limited. And then this is the 10 series one that I think I showed in my other video that has like some built-in XORs and some pull-ups and stuff. And that's kind of custom to just the 10 series. A lot of these other customs don't have, except for I think the 8 series and the 10 series, they don't have uh, open collector outputs and things like that. And so this is kind of just a one-off, which is why I didn't like etch it or anything. I just kind of, you know, wrapped it together uh, or soldered it all together and threw it up for that. And then this one I built the other night, this one I did actually etch here in the lab. And there's uh, dip switches for every single pin on the custom, so there should be 28 or so there. And what allows me to do is, uh, you know, if I decide I want to tie certain pins together on this socket and that socket, then I can just flip the switches and, you know, basically say, yep, I want to tie those together and tie those together and work my way around. And what's nice is it allow me to use this. Now that I'm done with the 4 Series, i got to move on to the 2 Series. I think that guy's over here. And so I can use the same exact, uh, the same exact daughter card. I can just... Look at the um, at the two series. Figure out where the inputs are. You know, click, click, click. Make sure they're all tied together, and then compare the outputs. So, worked out really well. It's just a pain because there's just so many subtleties, like I said, on this one, with the graphics and stuff, and all the different sprites. And you got the uh, what is it? The little underpasses that you pass by, and the explosions, the signs. That was a big pain in the ass. The signs. But uh, yeah, seems to be working. So, there you have it.